This is Interpreting Wine host and founder Lawrence Francis welcoming you to this, my Willamette Valley winemaker special. Across these 20 episodes recorded in quickfire fashion in January 2020, I got to meet a broad selection of people making wine in the region, both a variety of winemaking scale from the micro to the macro, and also different focuses that include different aging vessels, different grape varieties, sparkling wines, and of course, different interpretations of Pinot. Episodes are going to be released in the order that they were recorded, so you'll get to be a virtual guest on the tour. Two things you can do to help spread this series even further. One is to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already, either where you're listening or on your favorite podcast platform. And the second, the one that's really going to help push this out there, is to head to interpretingwine.com slash iTunes and leave a review letting me know what you think. A genuine huge, huge thank you in advance. Today's episode of the Willamette Valley Winemaker Special features ceramic artist and winemaker Andrew Beckham of Beckham Estate Vineyard. In what will undoubtedly go down as a clay winemaking masterclass, Andrew gives us his origin story and transition into the wine world. He gives us a virtual tour of the Beckham Estate and puts it into a wider Willamette Valley context. We get to taste five of his wines, one of them from the Beckham Estate range and the rest from the A.D. Beckham. And he talks about his clay winemaking vessel project, Novum. Enjoy. My wife and I got started out here on Parrot Mountain in 2005. We were looking for a property to build a pottery studio. I've been a potter for 30 years and we needed space. We were living in Portland and needed more space to pursue my career as an artist, as a ceramic artist and potter. And so we bought out here um, in the woods. It was a, a little house in the woods where we intended to have a pottery shop and um we got really sidetracked and distracted. The first winter we were here, we got to know our neighbors who were in their early 80s who grew Chardonnay and Pinot Noir on their vineyard across the street from us. And Fred was a former educator, and we had a lot to talk about and spent a lot of time together. He also sold Pinot Noir out of his garage for $10 a bottle on, on Saturdays. And so we spent a lot of time over there on the weekends um, talking about wine. And I helped Fred prune in the vineyard uh, the first winter we were here and came home with a truckload of Pinot Noir cuttings and said to my wife, Andrea, what do you think about planting some wine grapes on our property? And she humored me and and said, you know, sure, we can give it a shot. And what started as a couple rows morphed into a clear cut um, and a transformation of the property. Um, so we we started with eight acres and we planted um, four acres the first year we were here. A lot of it we rooted in our living room, sitting on our couch, uh, making a mess of our living space. This is before we had kids. Um, and we started growing Pinot Noir. And uh, I needed to learn how to farm and Andrea wanted to learn um, about what we would do with a product once we produced it. And so I went and worked with the local um, Hispanic laborers in the vineyards near us and watched what they were doing and asked questions and tried to figure out what was sustainable and what sort of farming practice we wanted to implement. Um, And we, over the years, added um, more plantings. Um, We have now six and a half acres of Pinot Noir and an acre of Riesling. Um, We started farming our vineyard organically in 2012. It's been dry farmed from the onset. In 2013, we added uh, an additional 20 acre parcel. Um, Once everything was planted out, we swore to ourselves that we wouldn't go through this crazy process again. And lo and behold, the opportunity came to acquire some land that was adjacent and we did it a second time cut the timber, pulled the stumps, um, propagated the vines, put the trellis in. Um, and the all of the, the clearing and um, development of the property, my wife and I did on our own. I ran the 200 series Traco and the high track cat and pulled in total about 2,500 stumps here um, and prepared prepared the land. And um, the, the vines that we um, put in initially, we rooted on our own as well as um all of the rootstock that we've chip grafted in the fruiting scion um, so it's been a true labor labor of love 
Um, in 2013, Andrea showed me an article on Elisabetta Foradori and her use of amphora in the Dolomites in northern Italy. And I thumbed through the photographs in the magazine article, and I said to my wife, I'm going to make some of those. And that's how the amphora piece got started. I um, went to the clay shop on Monday morning, and I bought a couple hundred pounds of terracotta, and I made some vessels um, for the upcoming vintage. And we were really, really enamored and thrilled with um, the, the the way the wine showed and how how much more compelling and interesting they were as compared to the wines that we were used to making. And so the project started with, with just a couple containers and at 40 gallons, I thought they were pretty large. Um, but as we continued to try to produce more wines in terracotta, we, we had to overcome several things, um, volume being one important one. Um, so I pushed the sale, the scale and size of the containers and over time they got as large as 150 gallons. And in fact, now we're working on some vessels that are, uh, just under 200 gallons. Um, so it was a, a long process. Um, we, we stopped using additives um, in our wines when we transition to organic farming as well. So we make the wines here on at the Beckham Estate property with no inoculums. We farm for chemistry. Uh, we don't filter the wines. Um, and we, we really are focused on growing the fruit for the style and uh, the parameters we're looking for in the finished wine. That's amazing. It's lovely to yeah to to be here with you and to you know have have walked around the property, which you know we're we're gonna get into. You know we're we're, we're sitting here surrounded by all the all the clay vessels and and the, on one side and the wood vessels on the other. And I do want to give that visual. One thing that it, it does actually come up a lot in winemakers' stories, really, and and has already uh, come up on this trip is is that um, you know there are and in your story that there is a quite a big transition there you know is from you know so obviously now it, it sort of closed the circle as it were and the and the, the wine is, is sitting in the ceramics but you know could you sort of take us almost kind of back to that very starting I mean ha had you already had sort of an interest in wine were you already sort of a wine drinker and and, and that was sort of igniting something that was already within you or, or you know as you sort of told that story was was it really just being with your neighbor and working with him that was sort of everything that that kind of really gave you that push and gave you that impetus to to where you've ended up now that's, that's a, a great question uh when we started here my wife and i drank more beer than wine and we really were not connoisseurs we we enjoyed wine from time to time, but it was certainly not a passion of ours. And it's so interesting how over time, um, interests and hobbies and passions can shift, you know, especially as, you know, you, you mature and you become older. And in our case, we had three children and um, everything here has been an evolution that, that seems to feed off of itself. And it's been a, a project that started with us thinking about just selling fruit mm. and turned into us mm. wanting to make wine, which morphed into us really, really considering how we wanted to farm the vineyard, especially as we started to have children, we really got um, conscious of our practice and wanted to, to think about sustainability. And, and all of this really leads into why we're using the terracotta vessels uh, because we are very concerned about our imprint and our footprint. Um, and it's, it's just been one thing that led to another that informed the next. And I think that actually speaks to why I so much enjoy using the terracotta vessels for our project. As the potter, as the ceramicist and the winemaker, uh, one thing informs the next. And in so many ways, um, either one of those projects would be in a vacuum without the other one to inform um, what's happening. So I can, you know, I can make a, an immediate adjustment in the clay chemistry, for example, um, if we see something that's not appealing in the finished wine, and then we can trial it. And we can then 
ex- look at the experience of the wine, and and that may inform another decision that we make in the construction of the terracotta vessels. Yeah. So, really, when we started, there was no intent to become winemakers, um, but the the story of our lives has been such that uh, it's things inform and feed and and dictate where we're going um, as we move forward. So, yeah, here we are. It's my first full day here in the Willamette Valley and already you know having you know now visited three properties I'm I'm getting a feel of of the the, the lay of the land really and and but what I'm asking everybody and I'm going to continue to to ask everybody is to really yeah get you to almost tell the listener a little bit about what you've just showed me almost giving them that kind of virtual tour of, of of the of the land around us so you know you, you've spoken there around the area of the land itself but kind of you know putting it into context what is it, what does it sort of look like what's surrounding okay. the land and and maybe you know if if it's relevant putting that into maybe a slightly wider willamette valley context as well you know where where are we on that on that map and sort of yeah what what is, what is the the sort of the positioning within those avas and you know going going from large and bringing us back to where we are at the property now okay. um so we are perched on the easternmost flank of parrot mountain and parrot mountain is an interesting place this um was part of the the route that the grand ronde indians took from the grand ronde valley when they were uh, going to the falls in Oregon City to harvest lamprey. So this, there are some interesting um, markers that are human-created by the Native Americans that lived here and, and um, migrated and tra- traveled across this mountain when they were going to harvest the lamprey. So they have actually modified trees up on Parrot Mountain. There are some that are bent in certain directions, and there are bones placed in others. And um, so this is a, a place that used to be known as Wild Horse Hill. And in fact, there's a um, there's a road right down the, the hill from us called Corral Creek, where the Native Americans would corral the horses. Um, so there's some interesting local history here. Um, the property that we own now is the South 40 um, of the Heater Homestead that was established in 1878. And the Heater family grew hops here until Prohibition. Um, amongst the old growth trees, it's it looked different than hop farming does in a modern setting. They would take treetops and put them into the ground and they would let the hop grow up the treetop. And when they were ready to harvest, they would pull the top out of the ground, lay it on on side and and harvest the the hops. And um, they did that until prohibition. And then they tried to grow black caps here. Uh, They used to stain leather and then strawberries and nothing worked on this Mm. rocky, steep hillside where we have an incredible amount of wind and it's very dry. And Bob Heater of Heater Road and and the original homestead um, planted this this property and the surrounding uh, 200 acres to timber in 1955. Um, so we, when we bought the property, it had second growth dug fir on it. And when we cleared the land and started to really uh, dig into the soils, it became quite apparent of what uh, quite apparent as to what we were working with. These are very shallow volcanic soils. Um, the parent material is jory or sulm would be the subtype, and we're on top of fractured basalt. So our site tends to to um, produce wines that have and, and fruit that has a lower pH and more total acidity um, than some of our surrounding neighbors and other vineyards near us because of the huge diurnal shift from day to night um, and the shallow volcanic soils and windy conditions. So from our cellar where we're sitting now talking, if we look to the east, we see Mount Hood. Um, we look to the northeast and we see Mount Adams. And to the southeast, we see Mount Jefferson. So the the property, the 36 acres we own here, um, has all aspects. We have a southern um, aspect, we have a western, an eastern, and even a northern aspect. And thinking about warming climate and the way that things uh, will present in the future, we're, um, we're trying to be forward-thinking in our planning. Um, so as a winemaker who doesn't 
acidulate or use additives in their in my wine. Um, I'm finding that it's becoming increasingly difficult to make Pinot Noir and the style that we enjoy. And so we really work hard on our farming to preserve natural acidity. But I think ultimately, if we're going to continue to grow Pinot here, it may wind up moving from the southern uh, facing land around to the north. And we per- put in some varietals um, thinking about warmer climate and what we're going to do in the future here. So we have a uh, um, pretty substantial planting of Trousseau Noir. Uh, we have Sauvignon Blanc. I mentioned Riesling and Pinot Noir. Um, we also have some higher alpine Italian varietals, um, kind of thinking about how we're going to hedge these conditions. Moving forward, we have Nebbiolo, Schipertino, Montuni, Albana, uh, and these are varietals that are not very commonly grown in the Willamette Valley. Um, we're just 30 minutes south of Portland, and we're right kind of at the northern end of the Willamette Valley in terms of where people grow wine grapes here. So what, like I mentioned, when we started, we um, we own rooted a lot of our, our Pinot Noir and some of it we have is grafted now, but it's really interesting how different these vineyards look um, when we're moving through the growing season. You know, we obviously will will have the potential for a problem with phylloxera here. Um, however, it's not on Parrot Mountain that we know of, but certainly is looming in the general region. Um, but it really is super interesting to me how much different the, the vines perform when they're on their own roots. Uh, so that's one thing that's, I think, different than some that grow Pinot Noir in the Willamette Valley is that we have a big portion of our vineyard on its own roots. Um, we have been dry farmed from the beginning, and, you know, that's always been very important to us. Uh, I mentioned that we've been organic since 2012. We're also um, working now to implement as many biodynamic pr- practices as uh, we can. We use sheep in our farming. We have a flock of 13 baby doll sheep that we um, use to mow and fertilize and punch in organics as we're shifting them through the vineyard blocks. Uh, we have free range chickens and bees and we raise pigs and uh, we're really trying to create a holistic system. Um, we are hoping that as years pass, we can work towards Demeter certification. However, at this point, um, we're, we're just using best practice with our farming. Um, the, the vineyard that we've established on the 20-acre parcel to the east of us um, was also done with a great deal of intention, established with a great deal of intention. Um, I propagated uh, about 20,000 rootstock vines um, on our living room couch again. Um, this time we had no carpet. Uh, we, we turned our shag to Berber the first, the first go-round, and the Berber was taken out because of the animals and kids and... Um, my wife is so happy now we finally have hardwood. Uh, but we, my wife and I propagated uh, the rootstock, and we grow it, grew it in position in the field uh, for three years. And then we had a crew come, a very specialized crew come from California, who did a T-bud or, or a chip graft, and we put the scion into the rootstock. Um, and it's really fantastic to see how these vines have come into uh, production so early on in their lives, um, as the vines never grew in a plastic pot on a bench in a nursery, but rather were grown in position in the field. You've yeah given us that virtual tour. Now we're bringing it right back here. We're sitting down at the at the tasting table. We've got four wines in front of us. Um, yeah, I guess yeah. Tell us about the brands that you've got going on here. You know, give us that kind of high level view of the of the winery and then let's get into the glass and yeah show us the the story of the terroir through the wines so when we started our project we um we created a brand called beckham estate vineyard and the idea was that we would work with the state grown pinot noir and, and riesling um these wines that are made under the beckham estate label are made in the same fashion as the wines we make in terracotta, um, but they are fermented um, in two-ton vessels instead of terracotta containers, and then these wines are aged in French oak barrels. And when we started this project, um, I 
learned by imitating my mentors. And we worked with a couple winemakers, one former geologist and scientist who really um, was all about data collection and information and repeatability and manipulation of chemistry to, to hit parameters. And I also worked with a school psychologist who was really all about how the wine made him feel. So it was two really interesting perspectives to um, to be a part of and, and two really different winemakers to learn from. But both of them used uh, commercial yeast. They filtered the wines. Um, they were looking for a much riper sort of profile in the fruit um, and used a lot of toasty French oak. So the first few wines we made in 2009, for example, the first vintage that we produced off of our property – for market, uh, we had a 15% Pinot Noir that was made in heavy toast Francois Frere barrels, and it was so much different than the wines we make now. Um, so it, it was a, a process of imitation, and then finally finding myself as a winemaker over time, um, and then honing in on, on my passion um, and the style of wine that, that Andrea and I like to make here. Um, so the, the Beckham Estate brand is where we started the project, and um, we have um, a great client base and a lot of support for those wines, and we'll continue to make um, the estate label in French Oak as it has a very particular style that really is in line with, um, with classically made Oregon Pinot Noir. Um, so with our estate Pinot Noir, what's in your glass now is our 2017 estate Pinot. Um, we, with our Pinot Noir, have a tendency to have really um, red fruit um, character in the wines. So the estate Pinot has, I think, a lot of red cherry, red raspberry, um, ripe red strawberry. Uh, there's just a little bit of vanilla essence that comes from the, the neutral oak we use, but it's very mild. Um, we're really not looking for any imprint or impact from from the oak. But interestingly, with, with wines that are aged in, in French oak, there's an apparent sweetness on the palate that's very different than the wines uh, that we make in terracotta. So these two wines, the 17 Estate and the 17 Creta, are really interesting to compare to each other. Um, the next wine in the flight will be the, the Creta, the Pinot Noir that's harvested the same day with the same parameters, the same composition of fruit um, with the four different Pinot clones we grow here. Um, they're really, really different wines. The Creta spends its life entirely in terracotta. So it's fermented in terracotta and then aged in, in terracotta vessels. And there's a really different sort of essence to the wine. It has, um, rather than fresh fruit character, more of a dried fruit character. So if we're thinking of those same fruits, the, the cherry, the red raspberry, uh, red strawberry, the, the wines in clay tend to be more dried in their essence. So like a dried strawberry, a dried raspberry. Um, and there's a, a very different feel in the mouth. Um, there's a familiar feel in the mouth that comes from, from the French oak. Um, and with the wines made in terracotta, we have a mouth feel that I liken more towards putting your tongue on a wet rock there's sort of a chalky brick-like dusty quality to the wines uh, that i think we find in in wines from around the world that are made in terracotta uh, but the expression in the mouth is is markedly different we see some other interesting characteristics when we ferment and age in terracotta as compared to um, our more traditionally made estate pinot noir um, maybe I'll back up and say that when we started making wine in terracotta, it was very important for me to have a point of reference. So I began a, what, what was a large experiment where we fermented in two-ton containers and we put that wine into a French oak. We also fermented in two con two-ton containers and put that wine into terracotta. We fermented in amphora and and put that wine back into amphora, and we also fermented an amphora and put that wine into wood. So we had at any given point in time four different sister wines that we could dig into not only from a sensory perspective but also analytically. And what we see um, when we're fermenting and aging fruit in terracotta that's different than the traditional wines is a lower finished alcohol, typically between two-tenths and a half-point lower in alcohol. Um, and if we look at the containers 
to the back of where you're sitting right now, the newer containers tend to weep and sweat a little bit in their first fill. And what we're doing is actually evaporating sugar through the wall of the pot and winding up with a lower finished alcohol uh, as compared to our traditionally made Pinot Noirs with the same parameters. So you can you can even feel here that some of these vessels are sticky. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a product of, of um, the sugars coming through the wall. And I think ultimately we're increasing concentration of flavor, um, but we have a, a lower finished alcohol. Um, when we ferment in the containers, the, the fermentation looks way different than in a traditional container of two tons um, with a non-inoculated condition and, and ambient temperatures in the cellar. Uh, we see temperatures in our two-ton containers that are typically around 30 degrees at peak fermentation um, versus 20 degrees in the terracotta. And the ferments in the two-ton containers typically take 10 to 15 days to go through primary and in the terracotta vessels in the novum um, the ferments take between 30 and 45 days so we have a wine that finishes with different character um, just after the primary uh, the wines from clay tend to be very bright and full of energy as their fermentation temperature is so much cooler then when we age in the containers, all of the really beautiful stuff starts to, to appear. Uh, because clay has a negative ionic charge, it's acting like a fining agent, like bentonite would. So we see wines that are lighter in pigment and also far less turbid at the end of their evolution. Um, you, can, you can actually see a different difference in color visibly in the glass if we're comparing these two sister wines. Um, the containers, the terracotta vessels are porous. So we have wines that evolve at a faster rate and tend to show as more complete wines earlier in their evolution. We typically bottle our wines from the Amphora, from the Novum at 11 or 12 months, where we go 14 to 16 months in the, in the oak barrels. And we have wines then that have had more oxygen on the front end of their evolution and we find that the wines that are that are made in terracotta vessels are very, very long lived um, as they've had that exposure in the beginning of their life. You can have a bottle open for days and it mm. it will um, hold its own um, for a, a lot greater duration than than the sister wine made in, in oak. OK, so th then we can we can talk next about our 2017 Pinot Gris. And this is a, a I think one of our signature wines that we make um, under the A.D. Beckham label. And for me, it's so exciting to to see the potential that Pinot Gris actually has if we don't make it as a boring, white, porch-pounding summertime wine. So in this case, we um, we work with a fantastic grower. We don't grow Pinot Gris on our site, but we work with a biodynamic producer um, who really, really does a very attentive job. In fact, he farms with horse and plow, and he's a, an amazing person um, and wine grape grower. Um, so this this fruit spends 11 and a half months macerating in terracotta vessels. There is about 20% of this wine, however, that is aged in uh, acacia wood. So we go about 45 days uh, with that lot and press and then put it into acacia. Uh, and the remainder of the wine spends um, just under a year in terracotta vessels. And there's something really interesting with the shape of the container and how it relates to the finished wine and the kinetics involved. So the Pinot Gris is a great example of a wine that is really affected by the shape of the vessel. Um, when we ferment in these containers, there's a lot of kinetic energy. And as the cap comes to the, the shoulder, it wants to roll over on itself and compress and turn back down. So we have very little issues with volatility as, you know, the cap is always wet. Um, it really has nowhere to go except back down into the container. And we do get into these containers and punch down by hand a couple times a day with most of these wines. Um, but if we miss a punch down, for example, the, they're quite forgiving. Um, and we can create very different atmospheres in the containers. We can treat them so the, they're very oxidative where we keep them open. Or we can ferment with the steel closures and they're very closed and reductive in nature. Um, but as this Pinot Gris finishes its primary fermentation and the skins begin to degradate and, 
and things loosen up, um, we see a deposit of seeds that form in the bottom of the cone. And once we go through the malic conversion, um, everything kind of floats up to the surface again. Um, and as we finish the malic um, conversion, what we find is that all of the seeds drop to the bottom of the cone in the amphora, and the skins fall on top of the seeds and form a protective layer. Um, so we're not extracting the astringent green seed tannins that we wouldn't want, but we have the benefit of these natural contents in the containers that are actually producing natural sulfites. So if we have this wine tested for sulfur at the end of its time in terracotta, there's sulfur in the wine that we've never added. Our general protocol with our wines um, made here is that we add sulfur in tank right before bottle. So a lot of our wines go, you know, as long as 16 or 18 months. In fact, we have a Riesling Solera that's five years with no sulfur um, as we, we sulfur when we, we bottle the wines. Um, but because of the, the shape of the container and the contents being in the container, we have a wine that stays very fresh um, during its evolution. And so this Pinot Gris has a really different fruit profile than a white Pinot Gris would. Um, for me, I get exotic tropical fruits rather than citrus notes, um, pomegranate, guava, candied strawberry. Um, it's certainly a red wine. I, I wouldn't call it a rosé. It's, it's presented as a red wine on most wine lists where it's sold. Um, as it's got color, just slightly less than Pinot Noir. Uh, it's got tannin like, like other red wines. Um, it's got a mouthfeel that is quite interesting. Um, and it's, I think, so much of the success of this wine is directly related to the shape of the container it's made in and and what the, the amphora has to bring to the picture. And because of the color um, and the some of the aromatics that we get from this wine, it to me is a harvest wine. It's a wine that you would see in a cornucopia. You know, it's it smells like fall. It kind of has a a wet apple and sort of forest floor mossy sort of essence to it. Um, it really resonates to me as a wine that, that you would have at, at the harvest season um, for, for many reasons. Mm. This is a wine that takes a lot of courage to make. When I made this for the first time in 2013, it was a two week maceration and then 14, we did 40 days. And the 15 that you had in, in England was um, 45 days. And it was actually at the Real Wine Fair that year, I tried and tasted Floridori's Pinot Grigio that was a seven-month maceration. And when I had that wine, I was like, ah, oh, this is what I want to make. And so I came back and I, it's kind of my nature, um, I couldn't just do seven months, I had to do 11. And so we we pushed and... Um, it's a, a wine that's quite cranky in its evolution at say six months. It's incredibly tannic, brown, ugly, not very pleasing in the mouth, but over the course of the next four or five months, the color drops back into the skins and the tannins polymerize. And it's just a wine that takes a lot of patience. It can be a little scary. You know, you could knee jerk and panic and pull it off when it really, it just takes time. I mean, this this is totally amazing. I, you know, I love the depth that you're going into here, and um, you're making my job very easy for me because it's this is just it's absolutely fascinating. And I'm just kind of curious though, because you know, I think what you're also doing, you know, in everything that you're saying is 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 telling your story and and telling your principles and you know, everything about what drives you and, and your attention to detail and just how you kind of do what you do. And I, I'm just curious then, so with this wine and talking about courage and talking about, I guess, let, letting go. And I mean, could you talk a bit about like maybe, you know, some of those times when you thought you might have to sort of do something, you know, you might have to potentially intervene or be more hands-on and, and what what was sort of going through your mind at at that time, which you know ultimately we know you didn't need to or or you didn't choose to to intervene, but I'm just curious to sort of flesh out a bit that kind of moment what was going through your mind what what were the what were kind of some of maybe the the the, the conflicts you know what was what was happening there that you thought I might have to do x hmm. well this 
I don't, I don't know if I can answer this entirely, but I'll give it a shot. So, um, I think going into a, a project like this wine in particular, um, one would fall short if they had a set expectation um, when the project was started. So I didn't really know what to expect after pushing it that long. And there were moments along the way when I was quite worried about what the wine was doing. Um, but I didn't have a, a set expectation. So I was free to kind of roll with it and continue to watch its evolution. And I think sometimes what we have to do as winemakers, if we really want to learn is we, we've got to try to destroy things. And I think, you know, this, this is a wine that, that maybe I felt at times like I was intentionally destroying. Um, we've got some, some amphora fermented and, um, and a really long macerated Sauvignon Blanc right now um, that I basically am trying to ruin um, to see how, how far we can push it. Um, and I think that's important to, to take that risk and explore um, where the boundaries actually lie. And I think with these long macerations, um, we're really noticing a couple things that are quite intriguing. I think, first of all, often the wine really tends to reflect what the biodynamic calendar is showing. And more often than not, when we're in the cellar and we taste these wines, there's an alignment with the calendar and, um, you know, what the, what the calendar is suggesting, um, the condition of the wine might be. And I think additionally, these long macerations move in cycles and there, there are small secular, um, developments of the wine where we may be in a, a magical moment and we don't capture it, but then it starts to fall away and we get really nervous and worried about where the wine is going. And then it will come back and we'll come back to the point where we might think about capturing that moment. And with courage, we may let that wine go through another evolution, another circle, another cycle of development. And I, I see these as secular cycles of movement and progression and there's often many. Um, it's not just one or two, but it could be a dozen, um, a, a dozen different instances where the wine is moving away from where you want it to be. And then it comes back and then it goes away and then it comes back. And I think it's understanding that process um, that's important to know when to say when. And I have made mistakes. And uh, I think, you know, that's the beauty of what we're doing here. They're we're in charge of our own destiny. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And um, you actually make me think to uh, an, another conversation that I had with a, with a winemaker, an Aus Austrian winemaker from Styria. And he was talking to the, that same cyclical process, but actually that happening post-bottling. So when, when he was then tasting his wines kind of year after year you know he he knew his wines you know the you're, you're sitting here you know virtually tasting there's a you know the wine is just here in my glass but the you know the you point being you know these wines back to front he was saying the same thing he's been making the, the wines for many many years and he said oh you know my 2004 has sort of closed up again it's gone back into its its shell whereas the the seven is really in a, a a good place and i'm just wondering yeah do, do you see that same cycle continuing even after you've kind of captured it at that optimal phase but but does that cycle still go on in some way once it's in the bottle yes absolutely that cycle continues um i think especially with wines that are made with very little to no intervention um you know, we, we typically add 25 parts sulfur to our wines and they're unfiltered. So the wines are living things. And sometimes these cycles in bottle give me fits that are really kind of harder to, to stomach um, as compared to these cycles and the fits that you might have when the wine is, has yet to go to bottle. Because once it's in bottle, it's sort of in a more permanent state. And we're really just along for the ride at that point. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, these wines um, that are made in this style and with these tendencies um, are always evolving. 
<clears throat> and that's the curious thing and the beautiful thing about about understanding how wines age and um, what they have to offer over time. Um, and we're lucky that our most of our sales are direct to consumer. And so we have relationships with most of the people that um, buy and consume these wines. And these people understand how the wines are made and what to expect from the wines. And they're certainly made with a lot of intention. And I think like my wife was mentioning, they're, they're classically made. They're, they're not out there. They're not bizarre. They're made with purpose. Um, and they can kind of float in both camps. They can, they can show at a natural wine event um, as a natural wine, but then they can also show in a more reserved, more cl- kind of classic venue. Um, even though they're made without product, um, they're, they're polished in their essence without polishing. Okay, so the, the next wine we're going to try is our 2018 80 Beckham 50-50. And this this wine, I think, speaks to the expediated evolution that happens in terracotta. For me, most of these wines made in clay are far more together earlier on in their life than the wines we make in wood. Um, so this is a co-ferment. It's 50% Pinot Noir, 50% Pinot Gris. And this product was born um, as a, a way to get out of the box of... Pinot Noir that's made in the Willamette Valley um, being very similar from one site to the next and one producer to the next. So we thought it would be interesting having made Pinot Gris on the skins um, for for many vintages to put these varietals together. And what comes as a result of co-fermenting these these varietals is something that is not either Pinot Gris or Pinot Noir. Um, There are notes that resonate as both of those varietals. Um, But there's a really, really interesting spicy tannin that comes from the Pinot Gris skins with a lot of uplifted red fruit character, very bright fruit um, that comes from the Pinot Noir. And it's a wine that we're increasing um, in production for the next vintage. We uh, doubled the production for 2019. Um, but it's, it's interesting to me that this 18 shows like a wine that could be a year or two older than it is, or even, even more mature than that. This is also a wine that I'm just now really starting to understand. And the current vintage, um, early in its evolution seems very disjointed. Um, we saw this with the the wine that's in your glass now, um, when it was, still aging in, in Amphora. Um, the two halves had not yet found um, a friendship. And as the wine continues to develop um, in container and then before bottling, um, that sort of union really starts to, to materialize and, and one plays off the other. That's absolutely fantastic. That's probably, yeah, the, the most quiet that you'll ever hear me on the podcast because genuinely, yeah, very, very, um, yeah, very touched to be able to hear that directly from you. And, you know, of course, I'm, I'm super happy to be able to, to share this conversation and, and, you know, get this conversation out there in the world. But, to, you know, to, to see the energy from you and be sat here, you know, this is, you know, definitely one of the most special things that I've uh, been able to do uh, in, in, in doing this podcast. And, the the kind of the almost the the cherry on on the top of having that experience is is the is the tasting you know because um again you know as we kind of spoke outside you know i always see the and i, I want to transmit that energy and 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 that information and that and uh, that that love really i guess that you have for the whole process um versus you know us just sort of sitting here and having some wine you know but i've got to say i'm i'm super happy with with the quality of the of the wines the 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 taste the um the the impact that yeah the the wine and the and the words are are sort of having on me and and yeah i'm just even more happier in a way that that i know that some or all of these wines are are available over in london as well so i don't (laughs) i don't have to sort of have this experience now and then need to come all the way back to 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 try some more It's, it's it's great to know that they're over there the thing that stands out for me when I think about these kind of as a family, I think I think I think with all of them they they just have this 
super kind of almost feminine, I would say, a delicate, almost floral nose on them. Um, and, you know, to, to the to the point where, you know, I, I don't think um, that, that they're giving almost they're not giving away as much as they do give away on the on the palate. You know, the, and and you know, very very pleasing. As I say, that that kind of um, that kind of yeah, that's as I say, that sort of sort of floral delicacy on the on the nose, and and almost kind of belies the the the, the power and the energy that that, that I'm, I'm I'm finding here on the palate. Um, I, I, f- I find it very interesting. Yeah, the I guess the, the yeah ma- maintenance of you know the Beckham Estate vineyard wines, and you know I I, I feel like that's that's a really really cool example of 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 pinot i really you know enjoyed um enjoyed having that and and i think it's again it's that kind of delicate pinot that that i think um yeah it's one that that really kind of kind of speaks to me i mean pinot is one of those grapes that can can bring out its its terroir it's a it's a it's a you know real terroir expressor and um through that process it's it's producing one thing put then alongside the the amphora that that's just yeah the the, the sort of the the ultimate um not to say experiment but it you know it's it's you know, if if it is an experiment in in your tasting and your and your education that's the you know that that's my kind of experiment that's my kind of education to have those two because it completely different completely completely different um not not so much in the in the appearance but yeah again it's 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 that that point around the aging them them sort of you know feeling more put together feel, feeling like a you know a, a more um yeah not, not not so much mature but yeah it just it just feels like a more um kind of grown up wine it just it just feels more, almost more more self assured almost like that just thinking about those those characteristics that you might expect in adults, when, kind of when when they grow up, and it is not not necessarily um, that you'd say oh, it, it's much much older, but it's just it just feels much more together. It, it's yeah, it's it's kind of difficult to put into words, as you can as you can probably hear. And I've I've had yeah, I've had the the, the Pinot Gris previously on the on the podcast over in, in, in London. Um, still, still, yeah, but it, it's it's yeah. I, I think I I probably really yeah delved into that in terms of the understanding the the process that you're that you're going through with that and and and, and kind of pushing that and it, and it, it, it seems like yeah maybe this is this is one that will just sort of keep keep evolving and who knows maybe you know kind of keep keep pushing and um a lot uh, pretty much everything that you said on the on the on the fourth wine you know completely agreed with it it's um you know i i i've tried you know relatively few co-ferments and i i just wish more winemakers would do it i wish that um you know there there wasn't a sort of a, a resistance you know albeit outside of sort of field blends or gemischte sats you know that that if you really think about it that there, there seems to be relatively few wines that are that are made in that way and and you know they have they have to be made with i think thought and uh, attention to detail around the the vessel that they're going into um and what style and you know just just doing it for the sake of doing it i'm not i'm not suggesting that but you know where where there's a kind of an intentionality coming from the winemaker then this is a you know again that same line that same delicacy but yeah a, a complete wine so this is a riesling solera this is um fruit that we harvested in 2000 15 and it spent um, about six months in amphora and then we started to see um, some development of four on the surface and we isolated it and moved it to barrel and it spent four years in barrel um, under four with no topping and when we moved from the commercial facility we were at to the cellar we're sitting in now the four died in the transportation of the wine. Um, and we then topped it with 2018 Pinot Noir. So there was roughly 15 gallons of 2018 that went into this barrel um, that had sat unsulfured for four years. 
and it's for me pretty interesting it's it still has a lot of energy and it's it's bright um but it has a viscosity that is is different than um Rieslings that were bottling earlier in their life. It has um, kind of a richness um, that's different than than Rieslings we've we've bottled in um, within vintage or within uh, a year of vintage. Um, and it it has sort of a, a nutty quality um, that I think is the result of of its situation under floor without topping, but it's not overbearing. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. It's it's pretty interesting. So now. We um, have gone down this path, and maybe we're going into a rabbit hole, but we're we're really looking at doing some extended aging with our our Rieslings um, and other white wines, where we may spend four or five years um, in container before we go to bottle. It's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, the of course, floor Solera. You know, the 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 mind Im- immediately goes to goes to Hareth, goes goes to those sort of you know, crisp finos and and those and those kind of manzanillas and but uh, you know the, as 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 you very I think very articulately described it, it just yeah I, I love wines that have age you know that 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 have have spent spent time maturing before bottling but that have retained the vibrancy. I, I would say, but but yeah, we're, we're we're sort of using lots of metaphors here today. We're getting getting very poetic, um, but but it's yeah, it's almost it's almost like a you know a, a person who is yeah is is sort of you know older in life, but but they've still got that that spark in their eye. You know that that there's 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 just yeah that there isn't that sort of I don't know impetuance of of youth. There's there's still a sort of a a knowing, a depth, a complexity, but they've still got that spark. They've still got that. Chispa, I believe, as they as they say in, uh, in in Spanish, and and when that is literally, you know, put into uh, a, a wine like this, I, I just think, uh, yeah, that the, there are some uh, fantastic examples out there, and and this is kind of another one, and yeah, I think more 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 of this kind of experimentation, definitely. This is a this is a, an absolutely gorgeous wine. Final question, really, and and to you know to close off, as I say, what has been a you know a monumental experience here. Um, just looking back here across all of these, as I now know, known as Novum. So, for the listener who may be hearing that word for the first time, I think yeah, firstly, talk to what is Novum. You know what what is what is the idea behind that? Because it you know it is your your own creation and your own trademark. I do believe. Um, and then, yeah, give us a, a sense of kind of, yeah, drawing back, I guess, from, from everything that we've just been talking about and these Nova and then going out into the world. And, and uh, yeah, what, what, what is that sort of looking like here in January 2020? Okay, I'll do my best with this. Um, so when I began making these terracotta vessels, um, I explored different geographic regions and cultures and the wines that are made in those containers from the different parts of the world where they're, they're constructed. And, you know, each of these cultures that, that uses terracotta vessels for winemaking has a different name for them. In Spain and Portugal, they're called Tinaja. Around the Black Sea, Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Turkey, they're referred to as Quevri. Um, it, please forgive my pronunciation there. Um, if if you were an Etruscan, you might call it a, a dolium. Um, and so I, I mimicked these shapes and thought about the wines and the intention and the outcome of the producers around the world using these different containers um, and ultimately decided to create my own shape um, that we've branded Novum, meaning a new beginning in Latin. And the reason we, we landed on Novum and, and my own shape and, and own, my own geometry and um, specifics for these containers is because I'm an Oregonian making terracotta vessels in the new world. And I didn't want to to claim to be someone or something that I'm, I'm not. I wanted to be very authentic about what we're making here. The commonality with all of these containers is the material. Uh, terracotta is earthenware. It's low temperature clay that is porous in nature. And so that's what these things have in common. As a default, winemakers around the world have often used the word amphora 
to describe a terracotta container that's used for winemaking. However, the amphora really is none of these things that we're using to ferment and age wines. Amphora were used for transportation, not for pr- for production and aging. Um, <clears throat> so the novum um, we're making here in, in Oregon are made from clay that comes from the East Coast uh, in the United States, and it's incredibly difficult to fire. It has a high concentration of silica, which makes them prone to cracking when we're when we're cooling the vessels as we finished our our firing process. So most of our time and most of the energy involved in the firing of the novum we make um, here on our property is controlled cooling. And I at this point have worked with five different clay chemistries, different clay bodies, um, coming from different regions in the United States. And as a winemaker and potter, I'm able to um, learn and and, um, take direction from one project and then relay that to the other. So the feedback loop is quite immediate. As a winemaker, I can trial a new clay body um, and then assess both sensory and analytically what the the wine shows like and then make adjustments to the clay chemistry. And it's been an evolution um, of product through the years uh, to land on what we're producing now. So these these vessels, the Novum, that we're producing for other winemakers, brewers, and distillers um, in the United States and and beyond um, are made with a, a very special construction technique. They're At this volume, 340 liters, 600 pounds of clay formed without any seams. So they're one piece. And that's very unlike other terracotta um, producers that that I know of um, in different regions. They they typically are made with a a coil and paddle technique um, where these are formed with um, 1,000 pounds of rotational compression. And we wind up with a vessel that has no joints or seams in it. And um, I've now sold them to many winemakers in, in my immediate region. My cohort um, has been using them for, for several vintages. They've made their way to Washington, uh, to California. I've sent them as far away as Oaxaca, Mexico for mezcal production. And the, the next focus um, for where these vessels are going that I'm producing is, is the world of brewing. Um, we know they work quite well and they're super interesting with wines, but um, I want to explore and other brewers want to explore, you know, what the vessels have to offer um, for beer production um, as well as as spirits. And so we have some people making uh, Nachino in them and gin and, and other um, spirits. And we're really eager to see what um, what evolves and, and what comes in the future uh, for Novum Ceramics. Thank you so, so much, Andrew. As I say, an absolute clay winemaking masterclass, and I'm sure one that winemakers and fans all around the world will be keen to hear. Do check out below for the Beckham Estate Vineyard that contains details of all of his wines. And as mentioned on the podcast, I'm very happy to say that the wines are imported in the UK by Le Carme de Perrin. So if you are over here and want to learn more, do contact them. That episode marked the end of my first day in the Willamette Valley, and we pick things up again next time in episode 384 with Doug Tunnell of Brickhouse Vineyards. If you know anybody you think would love to hear these episodes, do send them over to interpretingwine.com slash listen, where they can subscribe and be alerted when new episodes come online. And of course, I'd love to have you following along with me on social media, where I'm at Interpreting Wine on Instagram and Facebook at wine podcast on twitter and email hello at interpretingwine.com see you next time